Hey guys, I wanted to bring you part two of my medical journey. When I made part one talking about college and medical school, I asked if you wanted to see the rest of my journey, talking about residency, social media, traditional media, and you seem to really want it. So here we go, let's get started. I'm gonna talk about everything from medical school on. I think a good place to jump in here would be to talk about the match process. I know that gives people a lot of anxiety when we talk about the match because it's complicated, it's a major life moment that decides where you're gonna be for the next few years, and I totally understand that. Um, and especially, there's a lot of changes going on with the current match system because the DO match and the MD match are actually combining and are gonna become one match in 2020. So that brings an extra layer of anxiety along with it. When I was going through the match process, you had to decide if you're gonna forego the DO match and go straight to the MD match, or you can participate in both matches, actually. I've seen some people do that. They would pick a couple of their favorite DO programs, and if they didn't get into those, then they would automatically be pushed over into the MD match. I was going only for the DO match. Uh, I didn't want to do the MD match because I really believe in the DO philosophy. I wanted to train under osteopathic physicians and continue honing my DO skills. Not only do I believe in the philosophy of treating a patient as a whole and everything else that comes along with being an osteopath, but also doing the osteopathic manipulation. I've seen some great results with my patients, low risk tool that I have in my tool build that I can use in addition to medicines and surgery. I interviewed at probably, it was a large amount. Most people don't interview in as many places as I did, but I wanted to get a good picture of what it was like uh, in each of these hospitals. So I think I interviewed at a total of maybe 12 to 15 different hospitals. I applied to probably 30 places. Um, I went as far as interviewing in places like Florida, just because I wanted to see how different the healthcare system was within Florida, within New York, New Jersey, uh, Long Island even. And I found that my top two choices that I really enjoyed for family medicine were Overlook Medical Center and Jamaica Hospital uh, in Queens, New York. What really turned the tide for me was that in Overlook Medical Center, the residents got along really well and in residency programs, it's not unusual to see bickering between residents, especially because it's such a stressful time in your life. You think about how many hours you're committing to work. These people essentially become your family. So it's really important that you get along with your co-residents because you're gonna be spending a lot, a lot of time with them. I saw the relationship between the residents. I saw that they were being true. They weren't putting on a show during interview day. And when you go on some of your interviews, if you're going through this process, you're gonna see a lot of fake stuff happen. You're gonna see program directors, you're gonna see residents, you're gonna see secretaries, they're gonna put on shows for you. And I understand that. If you're trying to make a good impression on somebody, you're gonna put your best foot forward. But what was nice in Overlook, I saw that the residents weren't putting on a show. They were honest, they really were friends. You could see that even when you walked away from the interview process, you were able to see that they were really friends. They were talking, they were making plans to hang out. Plus Overlook does a really great job at allowing you to hang out with the residents, even go for lunch with some of the residents. Something that I do encourage everybody to take advantage of if they're considering choosing a specific residency program is doing something called a second look. A second look is basically when you come in on a non-interview day and shadow one of the residents around for the day to see what their daily duties are like. Definitely take advantage of this. Number one, you get to see what the program is like when they're not putting their best foot forward, when there may be an incident, where they might, where, where something might go wrong and you get to see what it's like and how they handle those situations. Funny enough, I think that I did my second look for Overlook on Christmas, either Christmas or maybe Christmas Eve. So you would think, right, you're going into um, a residency program where residents are working a major holiday and you would think they would all be unhappy, right? Because it's a major holiday, they're away from their families. None of that. I sat in on rounds. I went into the hospital with them. I got to see what they did on a regular basis uh, on a given day, even on a day like Christmas or Christmas Eve, whatever the holiday was. And guess what? 
They had great attitudes. They all got along very well. And most importantly, they were humble. In medicine, things change all the time. We'll make one recommendation only to change it back to the previous recommendation a few years later. This happens. We've seen this with coffee. In the 80s, we were saying coffee gives you pancreatic cancer. In 2017, studies are saying it makes you live longer. I think a good doctor is a good skeptic of themselves. That's why I always highlight that a good doctor should never be scared to say, I don't know. And in fact, say that the reason that I know this information is because it's based on the best information available to me now, but it may change in the future. We have to come with that kind of open mind when we're treating our patients. And that's the exact type of personality and leadership that I saw in Overlook Medical Center. I saw Dr. Tribuna, who's my program director. I saw Dr. Devine talk about those things. I saw that leadership happen amongst the residents and I said, this is a place where I want to train. These are the type of residents and leadership I want to surround myself with. They were amazing with their bedside manner. They were humble. They knew what their limitations were. These are definitely um, characteristics that I wanted to carry on as a physician myself. After leaving uh, my second look and doing the ranking process. Um, I ranked Overlook Medical Center as my first choice, Jamaica um, Hospital as my second choice. Uh, oh, let me get into the interview portion out of, out of some of these hospitals because this, this gets funny and I don't want this to throw you. In the previous video, I talked about what it means to have a good interview. It's all about being yourself. It's all about telling your story and it's all about vocalizing your story and your answers to yourself before you go in for that interview. Some of these interviews, and I'm not gonna name the programs because I don't wanna badmouth anybody, but they get just incredibly strange. It, strange is the right word for it because they ask really weird questions. I remember a doctor at a New Jersey hospital asking me what, if I was a vegetable, what vegetable would I be? Or if I was a candy, what candy would I be? And then I remember in one hospital in Long Island, one of the directors, actually he wasn't even a director, he was the behavioral uh, psychologist for that program, asking me this series of questions. And it was really strange. He told me, pick a person that you think knows you best and think about that person. And then he said, now answer these questions as if you're that person. Let's say I said my friend Mark was my favorite, was the person that knew me best. What would Mark say is Mike's biggest strength, AKA my strength. And then I had to answer. And then he said, what would Mark say? You know, Mike's a great guy, but what's his biggest weakness? And he framed the whole interview as if he was interviewing Mark, not myself. This may be a psychological, interesting way of interviewing somebody, but it's not human. And I didn't like that. I, I, I don't like when you try and play psychological mind games during an interview. That's not what it's supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about a one-on-one -on -one human connection. I never liked those types of questions. Um, when someone asks you them, answer them openly, answer them honestly, be human. Don't be afraid to talk about your faults. I did all those interviews. Um, I picked Overlook as my number one choice. Um, I was very nervous, wondering where I, where I would end up because you are gonna spend the next three years of your life at that place. And I know some people that go into very, very competitive specialties. Um, some of them are competitive because there's only, you know, single number of spots in a state. So they apply all across the country and they don't know if next, for the next three to five years, they're gonna be in California, in New York, in Florida, in Texas. You will see tears on match day. You will see smiles on match day. It, it's a very, very, tedious, unique process that applies to the medical journey. Now on my match day, I was doing rotations in Trinitas Hospital in New Jersey uh, for my internal medicine sub-I. And a sub-I is basically a sub-internship. You're basically the intern, which is your first year of residency, you're basically the intern's assistant and you get to do a lot of the things that the average third year medical student can't do. And I was doing that and I got an email on my phone saying that I successfully matched with Overlook Medical Center. I was so excited. I mean, to get your number one choice in whatever specialty you're going for is amazing. I remember Dr. Tribuna leaving me a very kind voicemail, welcoming me to the program, telling me how they're very excited to have me. 
And something that I really liked that he said, and I still can't really get comfortable doing, is he said, from now on, it's not Dr. Tribuna, it's Joe. And he wanted to call him by his first name. And I couldn't get used to that. I was there for three years. Every day that I would see him, I would say, Dr. Tribuna, out of respect. And he would say, Mike, Joe, it's Joe. And he would try and get me to call him Joe. He does that with all his residents. The nicest program director ever. Smart. Probably the best, I'm comfortable saying that, the best bedside manner I've seen in a physician. We talked uh, afterwards on the phone, both were really excited, and it was time to start my medical journey. I graduated, boom, I'm a doctor. I got my DO degree, um, and I had basically a month to relax before residency started, and I want to urge all of you, if you have some time off before your residency starts, please enjoy it. Go party, go explore, vacation, whatever you need to do to enjoy yourself, please do it. And I'm not saying that because residency is a horrible time in your life, but I will tell you it is a stressful time. There's going to be an insane time commitment that you're going to have to dedicate to the program and it's needed. You need to commit that much time in order to have a solid foundation for your medical learning. I went on some vacations during that time. So when I came into residency, I was fresh. That's what you want to do. You want to come in fresh, eager, ready to learn. The last thing you want to do is overwhelm yourself with research or something and then come in completely burned out into a place where the burnout rate is really high on its own. Now, you're going into residency and you're wondering, what should I do so that I learn the most or that I'm prepared the most? Nothing. Yes, you can read some books, you can look over some manuals and have some handouts in your pockets in your white coat, but nothing is going to prepare you for what you're going to experience in residency. I don't mean to sound dire, it's not that crazy and dangerous, but residency is tricky. You're going to be interacting with a lot of different people, nurses, doctors, um, MAs, janitorial staff, phlebotomists, patients, patients' family members. Uh, insurance companies. I mean, the amount of people you communicate with on a daily basis is going to be amazing. You're not going to know how to handle everything. You have to not be afraid to ask questions. That's the number one thing in residency. If you're confident about something, great. But if you're the slightest bit unsure, either A, look it up, or B, ask a senior for advice. Because the last thing you want to do is hurt a patient, hurt a patient's family member, because you're too proud to confirm your knowledge. I despise that about some people that are what we call cowboys in the field. They think that they read something somewhere on the internet, now they know everything about the subject and they're gonna write all these orders, put in all these medications without double checking. I double checked everything, even things I was somewhat comfortable with. I asked the senior to make sure that they saw me do the procedure, saw me do the order right. So I was treating the patient to the best of my ability. Obviously, as you get more comfortable throughout your time in residency, you'll be doing that less and less, and you're going to be teaching more and more. When residency first started, uh, my first two months were on the surgical floor. I was basically an acting surgery resident. And what's interesting about Overlook Medical Center is that not only are Overlook uh, residents there doing surgery, but also Columbia residents are doing surgery there. And that's why, the fun fact, Dr. Oz actually did some of his training at Overlook Medical Center as part of this residency. And um, basically what happens is as an intern, you get partnered up with a senior uh, Columbia resident and they basically teach you the ropes. Um, allow you to carry the pager, scrub it into some operations, um, basically jump in in the first week and you're taking care of patients. Someone's having high blood pressure, someone's becoming tachycardic, meaning their heart's beating fast, bradycardic the other way, their heart is beating really slow. You're the one that's getting paged first. You're the one responsible. And while I was happy to have that responsibility, I was also nervous and it's okay to be nervous. Nervous energy can be good energy if it's not chronic, meaning it doesn't happen over a long period of time. You need to embrace that energy and say, this energy, this anxiety is preparing me to take on this challenge of taking on these pages, these patients, and all of that. Initially, when I got some of those pages, I may have been a little too nervous and maybe asked my seniors for too much help just because I wasn't confident, especially because during my fourth year, I did a lot of family medicine rotations where you don't do a lot of surgery. And 
I, I was doing that because I wanted to figure out where I wanted to end up in terms of my um, residency, but because of that, I didn't have a lot of surgical experience. So I relied very heavily on the Columbia surgical residents to help me out. But then as the weeks went by, I became more and more comfortable in managing the patients. I became more and more comfortable answering pages. And it's really important because when you're on call, it's the middle of the night, you get a page, you have to answer it. Your senior is likely scrubbed in in the middle of the night in an intense surgery. And so is the attending. So you don't really have anyone to go for answers unless it's uh, obviously a dire emergency. So you get very good at using some of the hospital resources like UpToDate, um, which is basically a system that we look for for evidence-based medicine um, information. For example, if I saw a patient that was post-surgically having uh, a fever, you can go on UpToDate, search post-surgical fever, and get some information about it that can help guide your work up your treatment and so on and so forth. This is where it's probably really important to mention that during med school, I started an Instagram account and initially it was Dr. Mikey or something. It was like DR underscore Mike with like three E's or something like that because I wanted to show what it was like to be just an ordinary medical student, nothing special, but be able to enjoy your life, be able to have a a balance between exercise, education, social life, going out, enjoying nice events, but still doing well in school because I feel there exists a stigma, and I really think it's a stigma, that if you go into medical school, you have to give up your life. Myth busted, that is complete BS. Everybody needs to study very hard in medical school, but it doesn't mean that you have to give up your life. You can study hard, you can study smart, and you could do very well while still enjoying your life. So what I was doing, I was sort of doing a, what was popular back then? A lot of those, not MySpace, it came after MySpace, but it was one of those, um, it was like, not a blog, it, it was Zanga. Basically, what I was doing was showing my life through the internet. I was living my life through the internet and I was blogging. This was a, a new thing that people were doing in, in the mid to early 2000s. Zanga, Live Journal, these were popular blogging sites. But I was like, I want to do that on Instagram. I want to do a photo blog of my life. So I took selfies of me in the operating room. I took selfies with my dog. I took selfies with my dad at fancy events in, throughout New York City. And people really enjoyed what I was doing. So I built up a pretty significant following for the average person, somewhere 20, 30,000 followers going into residency. It was a running joke during my intern year that people that knew me well, they would make jokes like, oh, Dr. Mike has a lot of followers on Instagram with his 20,000, he was a celebrity. And look, we had fun with it. The nurses had fun with it. My co-residents had fun with it. Occasionally, they would catch one of their friends following me and we would tease them about it, but whatever, it was all in good fun. Uh, I thought it was something useful that I was doing, showing, you know, medical students what it was like to be a doctor, maybe people that just enjoyed medicine. And I thought that in the future, maybe this could be of some value. I didn't know exactly how it could be of value, but I thought that it was nice that I can communicate with thousands of people at home, just how I do with everybody in my everyday life. So despite calls from some people saying that, taking selfies was unprofessional or being on social media was unprofessional, I saw a greater use for it in the future, so I left it. It didn't take up much time. I would take a selfie here and there. Most people never saw me take a selfie. Um, my dad didn't even know I had social media because prior to this, I never even had Twitter or Instagram or any of this stuff. I don't think I ever overstepped the line and gave an un realistic view of what I was doing. I think that when you saw me smiling in those pictures, I wasn't just smiling for the pictures. I was smiling with my residents a few moments before that. I worked really hard. Intern year is crazy. I worked 36 hour shifts. When you're in the ICU, you're working six days a week on call every other day. Meaning that when you're on call, not only do you come in at 4.35 a.m., but you go home at 9 p.m. Just think about how little time that leaves for you to sleep or take care of yourself. It's a really grueling schedule. During that month, you learn a lot. Um, you do that rotation, I believe, two times in the first year, uh, at least for my program. Boom. I'm in my second year. 
and you get four weeks off. I, I think this is a requirement. You get four weeks off a year uh, during your residency. And during my first year, I didn't really have vacations towards the tail end of that residency year. So I did my first week of vacation in August, September of my second year. And guess what? I'm on vacation. I'm in Florida. And all of a sudden, one of my buddies texts me and he said, hey, man, you're on BuzzFeed. And I'm like, oh, man, that's really cool because while I've done some little news articles here and there, I've done some scientific publications, I've never had something as big as BuzzFeed mention me. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I read the story. It wasn't anything about my medical accomplishments. It was hot doctor and husky. And I was like, oh, that's nice. Like, awesome compliment. Pretty exciting. I didn't think anything would come from it. And then as the day went on, I started getting more and more texts from people. Not only about BuzzFeed now, now Elite Daily, then Huffington Post, then AOL.com, then Time, then Cosmo, then Glamour. And all of a sudden, my inbox starts imploding. I mean, everybody's emailing me that week. Ellen DeGeneres people, Steve Harvey people, everybody is saying, if you do our show, you can do our show, but you can't do their show. Uh, you, If you come on Fox, you can't do CBS. By the way, I don't remember exactly who said what, but this was all being said. And I'm a resident. I know nothing about media. I have no representation. I have no guides. I don't even know anyone in the industry, really. I was faced with a choice because... I'm a professional, <clears throat> I'm going into a professional field and I had to decide, do you embrace this hot topic, uh, sorry, this hot doctor topic as something that you wanna go in front of millions of people on television and talk about as if it's something you truly care about? I didn't really care that people were calling me hot doctor, but what I did care was that suddenly millions of people were interested to listen to me. And I viewed that as an opportunity. Honestly, it was insane. I gained 750,000 followers in those two weeks. My phone was just, I had to turn off notifications for the first time in my life. I've never had to do that for anything because so many things were coming in. I was answering news agencies at the time. And it's funny because I was on vacation and wasn't able to do a lot of the news stuff till the following week. I I reached out to them the following week, said, sorry, it's been so crazy. I would like to come on this week. They were like, oh, no, you're old news, man. Like, you, you were on last week. We, we talked about you last week. This week, we have no use for you. And I realized how cutthroat the industry was very quickly. Now, I'm getting these opportunities. My Instagram is exploding. What I felt like I had to do with social media was find a positive outlet for it. How can I get people that are watching nonsense Kim Kardashian videos and listening to Percocet Molly Percocet, how can I get those people to watch my content where we can have some fun, I'll dance like I'm a loser, whatever, have some fun, get some laughs, but also learn something in the process. I can talk about Percocet Molly Percocet and dance to it, but I can explain to you what Percocet Molly Percocet are. I try to find a balance between social media and learning. How can we make those two things coexist? From that moment, that was in 2015, it's January 2018 now, a lot has transpired. I've started a YouTube channel, that's how you're watching me now. Um, I've done a lot of television. Um, My social media has sort of transformed outside of just Instagram, it's on Facebook, Twitter, even I do some little Snapchat here and there. I do see a lot of people asking questions and making statements about how I am a doctor, but yet I am also a marketer because I do do advertisements on on my social media. And some of them say, oh, this isn't medically ethical for you to be a good marketer and a doctor. Those two things cannot coexist. I understand where that sentiment comes from. I see the TV doctors that are selling nonsense and compromising their medical ethics. I totally understand that. And I agree with you to a point. When I do an advertisement for, let's say, a watch company, I don't think that compromises my medical ethics because when I introspectively look at that, me recommending to wear a watch or not even recommending to wear a watch, me just saying I like this watch or I wear this watch has no impact on our doctor-patient relationship. Another place where I think that marketing can even be good for medicine is that when I do an ad for, let's say, Charmin reached out to me once and I did an ad for Charmin. Uh, they wanted me to take a picture in front of their Charmin on the go van where people go take poops, literally, on the street. It's pretty funny, but it's part of their advertising. 
They wanted me to take a picture of that and show that to my Instagram community. I wanted to take the picture, but I also wanted to use this opportunity to educate you at home and talk about the different signs and symptoms that you should look out for that might mean something serious or warrant further evaluation. So I told them, yes, I'll take a picture in front of the truck, but I'm gonna tell people to look at their poop and look at the different changes in their poops that should require them to go see a doctor. So I did two things in that. I advertised what they needed me to advertise. I made money that I can use for this YouTube channel to educate you and continue doing what I do to make money for myself, to feed my family, to feed myself and pay off my student loans. And I was able to get some education across. Again, I only do advertising for companies that I believe in that I would actually use. I wouldn't, you know, advertise some crazy, creepy products that I've been pitched in the past. I mean, I've been pitched just the nuttiest things in the world. Um, obviously I've gotten seven figure offers from vitamin supplement companies that want me to say, this is the next best thing. This is what's going to cure what ails you. This is, this is the solution. I will never do that. Why? Because as a doctor, I want proof that it works. And if it works, I'll recommend it as a doctor. I don't need to be paid to do it. That's my job. I'm already paid to do that. I really work hard to make sure that the things that I do advertise do not cross those medical lines. Lines sometimes do get blurry, but again, I will always make my best effort to make sure I never cross that because I'm a doctor first. Well, I'm a human first, but I'm a doctor second, and that's what's most important to me. Your health, our trust that we form between each other is really important to me, and I think that when you're a social media personality, that trust is even more important. I do have some more stuff to talk about, doing television. Um, I do a lot of TV now, Good Morning America, The Doctor Show, Rachel Ray, and that's a whole different animal on its own, and I'm also learning that process. So if you want to know more about that process and how I do it and what I do and what my journey has been like, comment below, give this video a like, and continue supporting good creators because that's what it's about. It's about having a community where we're all sharing our experiences. Those who are good storytellers continue being heard and I really appreciate what you guys do by watching my channel, sharing my channel, liking and commenting. I try to make a, a really serious effort to not only like and heart everybody's comments, but also jump in and reply as much as I can. I know that some of you have seen that and they may not be you know, paragraph replies, but again, remember, I am a doctor. I am bouncing around from place to place, so I do try my best. As always, guys, thanks for watching. Stay happy and healthy. I didn't move my chair, did I? This sound isn't annoying. Water, please.